Hi, I'm Bruce Goldfarb, author of 18 Tiny Deaths, the untold story of Francis Glesner Lee and the invention of modern forensics. I was supposed to do this presentation in person, but something came up unexpectedly, so I, I hope you don't mind that I do this from a distance. This is where I work in Baltimore the Forensic Medical Center for the State of Maryland. It's a state-of-the-art facility that's considered one of the best in the United States. It runs a lot like a hospital with laboratories, medical records, and an x-ray department. This is my favorite room in the whole building, neuropathology. The bright window along on the left side gives you a, a look down into our two main autopsy rooms from the floor above. This is one of our two main autopsy rooms. It's not a dark claustrophobic space like they show on a, uh, the TV shows. It's a big, bright, open space. Uh, this room has eight stations in it. The other room is a mirror image, has another eight, and there's a biosafety suite with six stations in it. So the facility can do 22 autopsies simultaneously. This is the gallery where police and other observers hang out during autopsies. There's actually a law on the books that says that you can't be inside the autopsy room without the permission of the chief medical examiner or his designee. And as the chief's executive assistant, I'm his designee. This is the only place in the state of Maryland where I could tell a police officer that he has to move along or I could have him arrested. Haven't had the opportunity to pull that authority yet, but I, you know, I hope one day maybe. The building even has a training facility, a lot like a studio apartment that's used to train forensic investigators. Nobody's actually heard. A moulage artist makes the wounds look realistic. The scenarios get quite elaborate, some with multiple uh, victims and are investigated just like real scenes. This woman is showing a defensive wound. Here's Dylan having a great time. The OCME of Maryland is probably best known for a collection of dioramas known as the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. This is a collection of 18 dioramas produced between 1943 and 1948 exquisitely detailed. Each one of these dioramas cost just about as much to build as the cost of an actual house. I, I don't know how that got there. The dioramas were created to train police officers to practice the crime scene investigation skills. The nutshell studies are used in a very intensive week-long homicide seminar that's held every year. Frances Klesner Lee, the mother of forensic science, created the nutshell studies of unexplained death and established this homicide seminar in 1945. Frances Glesner Lee was born in 1878 in a fairly wealthy family in Chicago. Her father, John Jacob Glesner, owned a piece of International Harvester Corporation, which at the time was the largest manufacturing company in the world. The Glesner family lived in a landmark uh, home on Prairie Avenue in Chicago that was designed by H. H. Richardson. Frances and her only sibling, her brother George, were homeschooled by some of the finest educators that money could buy. Uh, George and Frances were uh, uh, educated in uh, literature and the languages, the natural sciences, mathematics, art, dance, music, and extraordinary education. The family had a summer home in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, an estate that they called the Rocks. Later, as an adult, Francis ended up living here full time. Francis married an attorney by the name of Blewett Lee, and the couple had three children, 
before they divorced. The Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death was not Frances Glesner Lee's first work in miniatures. In 1912, she created a scale model of the entire Chicago Symphony Orchestra. The orchestra model has 90 figures and their instruments, each person uh, dressed in formal evening attire, and they're finished to look like their real life counterparts. Each musician has sheet music handwritten on paper about the size of postage stamps. The following year, she made a model of a well-known string ensemble of the time known as the Flanzeli Quartet. The Flanzeli Quartet model, done in the same scale as the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, is on display at a museum in Switzerland. To appreciate what Frances Glesner Lee did, we have to go back in time. For most of American history, deaths were investigated by coroners. The coroner, the sheriff, uh, and the justice of the peace are all vestiges of the Middle Ages. Uh, the coroner was the royal uh, representative. He was the keeper of the pleas of the crown, uh, called the, the crowner, which uh, uh, was corrupted into coroner. And it was the coroner's uh, responsibility to investigate shipwrecks and treasure troves to make sure that the crown got their share. Uh, they also seized royal fishes, such as sturgeon and porpoise that were only fit for the palate of a king. And uh, the coroner was the person who was authorized to serve papers or arrest a sheriff if that were necessary. Uh, and also, by the way, they investigated deaths. Even though the coroner had a combination of legal and medical responsibilities, he didn't have to know anything about law or medicine. The coroner relied upon an inquest, similar to a trial, in which a jury hears testimony from witnesses and considers evidence and then renders a verdict by voting, sort of a crowdsourcing a death investigation. In this late 19th century news illustration of a coroner's inquest, the jury that is seated along the right side is listening to the witness who's standing to the left. And in between the witness and the jury is the table of men who are there at work. Those are reporters who are making sure that every unsubstantiated rumor and salacious detail makes it into the afternoon papers. In some parts of the country, Coroners are elected to office like any politician. The coroner is a political official and he is, uh, doesn't get the job because he is the most expert, the most proficient uh, at his job, but he gets it because of his political affiliations, his loyalty, uh, popularity, name recognition, and this, the coroner systems uh, in general, there, there is a historically a, a tendency for corruption, incompetence, um, political influence, and those sorts of things. Uh, and most importantly, the qualifications to be a coroner really vary significantly throughout the country. For example, in the state of Indiana, coroners are elected to office as they are in New Orleans and other places. The requirements to serve as coroner include being eligible to vote and uh, residing in the state for at least a year. By comparison, to be licensed as a barber in the state of Indiana, you're required to have 1,500 hours of training. Uh, to be licensed as a nail technician and give a manicure, you have to have 450 hours of training. Medical examiners and accredited facilities are forensic pathologists. So for one thing, they're doctors who have completed medical school. In order to get to that point, you've had to have four years of pre-med, four years of medical school, and then you have a residency in a specialty such as pediatrics or surgery, cardiology, whatever. In this case, it's pathology. And then you have a fellowship um, at, uh, in a subspecialty. 
um, in this case it's forensic pathology and you are trained specifically in the patterns of injury and illness related to death, uh, you successfully complete that and you take your boards uh, and, you're, and you're ready to go. So uh, a forensic pathologist has had uh, at least 13 years of training before their first day on the job. This is not to say that all coroners are bad or that all medical examiners are good. There are always exceptions, but in a general sense, there are substantial differences from place to place regarding how sudden and unexpected deaths are investigated, who does the investigating, under what circumstances, what their qualifications are, and uh, what, uh, what the uh, kind of facility in which it's done. Um, in general, the Population centers on east and west coast uh, generally have medical examiners. Uh, about half the population is still on the coroner system, however. Uh, some places have both. It's, it's very, very confusing. The country is covered by a patchwork of systems. There can even be huge differences within one state. In New York State, for example, there is a medical examiner's office in New York City and in Erie County in Buffalo and in Monroe County in Rochester and some other counties, but the vast parts of the state are under the jurisdiction of elected coroners. Uh, I grew up in a suburb of Buffalo, Amherst, New York, which is in Erie County, and at some point there is a county line, a boundary, where if somebody dies on one side of the street, their death is investigated by a medical examiner who is a civil servant, and if they die on the other side of the street, their death is investigated by an elected coroner. Desk, uh, death investigations vary throughout the country. In some places, the, an autopsy may, be, may not be done at all. Uh, that may be done uh, in a hospital or in a nursing home or literally in somebody's garage or it could be investigated by a team of professionals in a state-of-the-art facility, such as it is in Maryland. How was this woman, a child of Gilded Age affluence with no formal academic credentials, drawn into forensic science? Francis Glesner Lee was introduced to legal medicine, now called forensic medicine, by George Burgess McGrath. McGrath attended Harvard University with Francis's brother. She had known him since she was a teenager. McGrath was a doctor, a pathologist. He trained in legal medicine at some of the leading centers in Europe and introduced the scientific methods he learned there into his work as medical examiner in Boston. McGrath gained a reputation as a Sherlockian crime doctor throughout New England and was involved in a number of high profile cases, such as the 1919 Boston molasses disaster, the Sacco and Vanzetti case, and the death of Babe Ruth's first wife. Frances Glesner Lee rekindled her friendship with Dr. McGrath in 1929. When they spent time together in Boston, he told her about his work and explained that these problems that were related to the coroner and medical examiner systems. Francis Klesner Lee came to realize that three things were needed in order to improve death investigation and move away from the coroner system to the uh, medical examiner system. The first being to address the need of well-trained, qualified medical examiners. Uh, to train forensic pathologists, and towards this end, she began supporting Dr. McGrath's work at Harvard in 1931, and then in 1936 gave the equivalent of $3.8 million to establish an entire department of legal medicine to do research, uh, do educational programs, and to train forensic pathologists. Uh, the second part that was needed was to reform laws. Uh, laws needed to be changed to abolish the coroner system and coroner inquests and to enact medical examiner laws. And places that had medical examiners, the laws needed to be reformed to give them greater independence and autonomy. And Francis was involved in reforming laws in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, 
Virginia, Connecticut, Washington, D.C., and many, many other states. The third component was to uh, train police officers because the police were the first responders, and they still are. Uh, in some cases, they're the only people who were at the scene of a death. And so it was very important that police uh, be trained in forensic science so that they may recognize things that might be significant, so that they recognize evidence, so that it may be uh, collected and, and processed and interpreted correctly. This was addressed by the homicide seminar that she established in 1945 and where the nutshell studies of unexplained death come in. They were developed as a teaching tool for this homicide seminar. This homicide seminar, which I showed you at the very beginning, is now known as the Francis Glesner Lee Seminar in Homicide Investigation. It's still conducted the same as it was in 1945 and still uh, uh, employs the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death for study and is the longest running seminar of its kind and still regarded as the best of its kind. For her work training police officers in death investigation, Frances Glesner Lee was commissioned as a captain in the New Hampshire State Police in 1943. She was 66 years old at the time. This was not an honorary commission. She was a real captain with arrest powers and the authority to enforce the law. She was, referred to herself as Captain Lee for the rest of her life and carried a gold badge in her purse but never actually worked a case or made an arrest. Part of Francis Glesner Lee's mission was to raise public awareness and to educate people about the medical examiner system and how deaths were investigated in the United States. And as a part of this, she befriended this gentleman, Earl Stanley Gardner, who is the author of the Perry Mason stories and was at the time the best-selling author in the United States. They had a very close friendship, and the book has a, what I think is a delightful anecdote about a road trip that Gardner and Francis Klesner Lee had to police departments along the eastern seaboard. Francis Klesner Lee is also responsible for the production of what is the first procedural forensic drama film, Mystery Street, which was released in 1951. The first draft of Mystery Street actually focused on Francis Glesner Lee and the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. At her request, she was written out of the story, and at her suggestion, the story in the movie was actually based on a real case. Mystery Street was the first procedural drama based on real events, ripped from the headlines, showing cutting-edge methods, this was the forerunner to Quincy and CSI uh, and all those shows and has grown to become one of the most popular genres in film, book, television, streaming, podcasting. Frances Glesner Lee truly is the mother of forensic science, both in the field and in popular culture. And that, in a nutshell, is the abbreviated version of who Frances Glesner Lee was and her role in the development of forensic science. My book, of course, goes into considerably deeper detail. I do hope that you would buy it, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for listening.